Hello and welcome to Pre-Algebra Matthew C Lesson 13. So this is solving using a multiplicative inverse, which aside from being a really cool word to say, is a pretty cool concept that we don't really even need to know the name of. So let's see how this goes. The multiplicative inverse of a number, a, which I realize a is not a number, but this is a thing we do in math where we represent, we represent things as letters so that we can talk about it for any number instead of specifying a specific number. So the multiplicative inverse of a number a is the number that when multiplied with a gives you one. Now lesson nine, I believe it was, we talked about the additive inverse, that that's the number you add to something to get zero. The multiplicative inverse has to do with multiplication. And because it's not as interesting to think about what multiplies to get zero, because it just has to involve zero. Uh, it's more helpful to think about what do I need to multiply a number by so that I get one? Is there something consistent that we can think about so that we'll always, you know, get one just by thinking of a certain kind of number? And the answer is yes. We have a thing that, for instance, if I do two times something equals one, that always works. So you might be thinking, hmm, I don't know the answer to that. Or maybe you're thinking, I know exactly what the answer is. Or... Maybe you're thinking, if only this was a division problem, I'd know the answer. Any of those three things we can work with. So two times one half gives us one. So I'm gonna fill in one half to this blank right here. Okay, because think about it like two over one times one half, the twos cancel, you end up with one times one over one times one, which is one. Now one half, aside from being the multiplicative inverse of two, has another word that you might be more familiar with, it is the reciprocal, okay? So this number right here is the reciprocal of two. And that's kind of a fancy math word for talking about taking a number in its fraction form and flipping it over. So taking two, thinking of it as two over one, and then flipping it over so that we get one half. So we just thought about this for a specific number two, but our definition of multiplicative inverse used the letter a. So that means we could say, okay, if I have a instead of two, I'm gonna multiply by one over a. Because if we think about how numbers work, a specific number works, and then we think about, okay, let's take out the specific number and write it in general. Oftentimes it's just a thing of saying, well, here's where the twos were, now those need to both be a's. So basically, the multiplicative inverse of a number is just the reciprocal of it. And that's what's gonna help us get one. Now, I said at the beginning that this is kind of an unnecessary thing for us to know about. It is important that it exists, um, but I doubt very often from here on out you're gonna hear the term multiplicative inverse, even if it is something that you're going to use. Here's where we use the idea of a multiplicative inverse. When solving equations where we've got multiplication, the way to kind of reverse what's happening to the variable is to think about division or to think about the reciprocal of what we have. So here we have 4x equals 20. And so we can think of this one of two ways. We can either think of this as, here let me divide both sides by four. That's the way we can think of it, or the way to think about it like it's a multiplicative inverse, I just like saying it because I'm very proud of myself for being able to say it. If I want to think about the multiplicative inverse, I would times both sides by one fourth because that would be the multiplicative inverse of four. That's the thing that's going to get me this canceling so that I'll just end up with a single x instead of four x. So in my personal opinion, it's easier to think of it the first way where we're thinking, okay, we've got four times X. So to get rid of that four, I need to do the opposite and divide both sides by four. Um, if you like this way using the one fourth better, that's fine too. Either way we do this, we should get X equals five. And honestly, you maybe thought of that without even having to actually write anything down, right? Because we can think four times what equals 20. Oh yeah, the answer to that should be five. And when we check our answer, that's exactly what we're going to think. We're going to think, okay, let me put five where X is. And let's see if this is true. Four times five. Yep, that's 20. So we got it right. So 
let's look at b and then we're going to get on to basically just consistently more complicated equations as we go okay so this by the way we're in pre-algebra but this is really what algebra is about is solving equations so it is my hope as a as a as your pre-algebra teacher if i'm your pre-algebra teacher it's my hope that you definitely get how to do this first example right um, and the second example and then once we get to kind of the third example where it's kind of complicated um, i would understand if you're having trouble with that so keep that in mind that this is a new you know this is a new thing and we're going to build on these algebra skills as we go so it's okay if it's a little bit shaky here while we're first learning it so 8y equals 64. You can think in your head about the answer. The, the work that we would show, the thing we're actually doing, is we're saying, let me divide both sides by that 8 that's in front so that I get y equals 8. And that should be our answer. Let's check it. 8 times 8 equals 64. Is that true? Why, yes. Yes, it is. 64 does equal 64. Like I said, let's make this a little more complicated. So. The instructions here actually give us a hint of where to start. Simplify by combining like terms, then solve using additive and multiplicative inverses. So the second part of that where it's talking about our inverses, just think solve using the rules of algebra. That's essentially the same thing, but it's telling us that we should look for like terms here at the beginning. So on A, we've got a 2x and a 4x together on the left. This can be tricky. We want to add those together because they're on the same side, which is different than what we do on our next step, where we say, okay, I've got an X on each side and I want to move them so they're together. So when we do that, that's where we use our additive inverse. That's where we say, I'm going to subtract three X over. And that can be confusing. So you got to think about it as, as kind of two different issues when we're trying to simplify things that are on the same side, we just do it like normal. So 2x plus 4x gave us 6x. But when we're actually trying to move things across the equal sign, that's when we have to use the opposite of what we have. So it's a positive 3x on the right. To make it not be on the right anymore, we had to subtract 3x so that that would make a zero, right? But we also have to do it on the other side to keep our equation balanced. So 6x minus 3x is 3x. And then part of the issue here is knowing which thing to do first, right? So we always save what's right next to x for last. It's the last thing that we're going to try to move. So if I'm looking at 3x minus 10 and I'm thinking I know that the 3 and the minus 10 need to go, but I don't know which one to do first, we're always going to save the thing next to x, which is 3 uh, for the very last. So that means let's add 10 to the other side. And that's essentially because it's we got kind of an opposite order of operations thing happening here from normal because we're trying to undo what's been done to x. Let me move over here to this side. 3x equals 18. Divide both sides by 3. And x equals 6. Now frustratingly, right, the more complicated our equation is, the harder it's going to be to check. But also that's the time that we will most want to check our answer if we were wanted to really make sure that we were doing it right. And as a side note, like ch this checking our answer thing that we're doing and you, we're having to use the normal order of operations where we do multiplication before addition and subtraction, um, that is a good skill to be practicing because that's actually one of the things we're going to talk about in the next lesson, lesson 14. So we do this multiplication first. So 12 plus 24 minus 10 equals 3 times 6 is 18 plus 8. As annoying as it is to like pause and unpause the video, definitely feel free to pause if I'm going uh, faster than you can write. Um, because this, you know, I, I do a lot of math every day. So, so this comes pretty quickly to me, like doing multiplication and stuff. Okay. 12 plus 24 is 36. You might need to come out to the side right to do that. 12 plus 24, 6, 3. Let's go ahead and minus the 10. So that gives us 26 on the left. Same with 18 plus 8. You might need to come out here to the side. What I think when I do 18 plus 8 is my head 
in my head is go, I'm going to take two from that eight to make 18 turn into 20. And then I have six left over that adds to that 20, which is how I get 26. So I don't know if that helps you out at all with how you might start trying to do some of this in your head, but there you go. Let's look at B. 2a minus 10 equals 5a plus 2a. So 2a minus 10, there's no like terms there, and they said we should do like terms first. 5a plus 2a is 7a, and there's actually a different way to do this where we don't add the like terms first, and that's kind of my bad for picking what I picked uh, for this problem. But if I add the like terms on the right side, I get 7a. Now we can move the letters to either side that we want to, so I like to move it so that I get positive numbers when I can. So I'm going to take the 2a and subtract it over so that I'll end up with a, a positive number of a's on the right. We don't have to, but actually in this case it will save us an extra step if we do it this way instead of subtracting the 7a over to the left. 7a minus 2a is 5a, and then what we have left is just to think what times 5 equals negative 10, or to go ahead and divide by 5, and we get a equals negative 2. Um, the more that we're having to write down, the better an idea it is for you to circle or box your answer. Just the whole problem is really part of what your teacher is going to look at, hopefully, but the answer is kind of the, the place we focus on first to say, did you get it right or wrong? And then once we know whether you got it right or wrong, then we look at the rest of the problem to make sure everything else went okay. Uh, so circling or boxing your answer can be super helpful. Let's check this. 2 times negative 2 minus 10 equals 5 times negative 2 plus 2 times negative 2. Got to be careful here with our positives and negatives the whole way through, right? But 2 times negative 2 is a negative 4. And 5 times, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10. 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. So this is going to give us negative 14 and negative 14. So voila, I think we did it right. Example 3, simplify using the distributive property and solve. So in, in math, and maybe just everywhere, when we see parentheses, our eyes are supposed to be kind of drawn to the parentheses to say, okay, I need to do something with this most likely first, um, at least right now where we're at in math. It, it, almost for sure, that's what we're going to deal with first is the parentheses. So a couple of lessons ago, right, we did the distributive property, which says this number on the outside, I'm going to multiply both of the things inside the parentheses, and that makes the parentheses not need to be there anymore. So 5 times 2 is 10, and 5 times negative 3n is negative 15n. Then we'll do the same thing over here on the right side. Negative 2 times 4 is negative 8, and negative 2 times 6n is negative 12n. Let's see. We need to get our n's together and our numbers together. If I add 15n, that'll give me a positive n on the right side. It would be fine if I wanted to do it the other way as well. Your choice. We should still end up with the same answer. Negative 12n plus 15n is 3n. And then we need to stop and say, okay, what do we do now? Uh, next to n, we've got the 3. That's going to be saved for last. We're going to take the negative 8 and move it over by adding it. So I'm going to plus 8 to both sides. 18n equals 3n. We're going to divide both sides by 3 get n equals 6. This one did not ask us to check our answer. We still could check our answer if we wanted to. Um, it's just going to involve us putting the 6 where n is and working everything out to see if we get the same thing on both sides. B. I did not notice until now that I have a capital X here and a lowercase x. And depending on what math we were in, those might be representing different things. But that's purely a mistake on my part. Um, those should both be just regular x's. You can pick which one you want to think of it as. Um, math you see in the workbook uses capital letters for variables, which really annoys me because that's not 
usually what we use whenever we're in algebra. We usually use lowercase letters for our variables. So um, it's kind of hard to tell though when you're writing x's whether they are uppercase or lowercase. Anyway, negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. Then we go over here and distribute on the right. Negative 5 times negative 4x is positive 20x. Negative 5 times 5 is negative 25. Then we've got this minus 47. When we distribute and there's something else around our parentheses on the same side, chances are we're going to have like terms to add. So in this case, we've got negative 25 plus negative 47, which I'd come over here to the side and add together to one, seven, and because they're both negative, I get negative 72. So we do negative 2x minus 6 equals 20x minus 72. We're going to get our x's together and our numbers together, so it doesn't matter which way you do this. I'm going to add 2x to both sides. So I get negative, set, negative 6 equals 22x. Man, that's a big number in front of x. And then I'm going to add 72 to both sides. So plus 72, plus 72. So negative 6 plus 72 is really the same as 72 minus 6. So I'd have to borrow and get 66, which is good because 22 does go into 66 evenly. Hopefully it's something that you could like guess at and then maybe check yourself. If I divide both sides by 22 here, I get 3 because 3 times 22 is 66. Now let's look at a couple of word problems. Now word problems are tricky in that they tend to just be the thing that trips people up uh, because you're being asked to basically, in this case, set up an equation and solve it and, and that can be difficult because you have to like be able to visualize kind of what they're talking about. But the other difficulty with word problems is that they can seem really lame, if I'm being honest with you. And that's mostly because the kind of word problems that would actually show you where we might use equations in real life are just too hard for us to do in pre-algebra. So we have to simplify things uh, and, and that makes them kind of corny or, or silly a lot of times. So to the best of my ability, I always try to come up with things that will, would be relevant to you, that you might actually decide someday to use an equation to solve or whatever, um, but sometimes it's just not something that really works out. So keep that in mind as you're doing word problems. So example four here, you decide that you want to save $80 to buy some cool new thing. Pick whatever that cool new thing is. You currently have $20 and you think you can save $5 a week. Write an equation to represent this situation. How long will it take you to save $80? Now we could do this by just kind of guessing and checking um, and working out the math, but it asks us to write an equation and so that's what we're gonna do. We're trying to get $80, so our equation needs to end up equaling $80. And then we have to think, how does the $20 we start off with and the $5 we get each week, how does that play into creating a situation where we would get $80. And also, we need a variable, otherwise it won't be an equation. So typically in a problem like this, the variable comes from where we see something per something, or in this case, $5 a week. So our variable is going to represent how many weeks have passed that we've saved $5. And so we're going to need a 5x because every week, at one week, we'll have saved $5, at two weeks, we'll have saved 10, and so on. But we started out not with zero, but with 20. So we're gonna say, let me add 20 to this, and then um, that gives us an equation to solve. So how do we solve this? We're gonna subtract 20 from both sides. And get 5x equals 60 then divide both sides by 5 and get x equals 12. So that means it will take 12 weeks for us to be able to save up for this thing that we want that costs $80. Example 5. So this is kind of on the more corny side. I'm thinking of a number n. 3 times that number equals 21. What is the number? So 
I'm thinking of a number, three times that number, so let's do three times that number, equals 21. It's really about translating these words into math, right? So they told us to use n to represent a number. We're doing three times that, so three times n. Equals means put an equal sign, 21. Now we can figure this out, and probably we didn't even need an equation for it, right? Because n would have to be 7. And we can go back and think through that. Is that true? 3 times 7 equals 21? Yep, that's true. Thanks so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Please feel free to give me a thumbs up to show me that you liked it. And uh, also subscribe if you haven't already, because that's something that helps out YouTube channels. I know it can be kind of annoying, especially if I end up, you know, posting like six videos between now and um, next week. But hey, you can still ignore those videos. You don't have to click on all of them. But I mean, you could subscribe and, and help me out and that would be super cool. I am currently at 1,333 subscribers, which is a really nice number, but I would love to have more than that as well. All right, see you in the next video. Bye.